Amen. Amen. Be seated right now in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And I want to just bring you warm wishes for each and every one. Uh, best wishes for a, I was going to say a prosperous, I love, I love the word abundant new year instead. Amen. Overflowing always with the grace of God. Amen. 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 Good health, long life. That's important when you come to my age too. Amen. <laughs> Praise God, it's good to be back and good to be in some warm. Yes, we have been away and uh, it was a time that was very cold. Uh, my wife, myself, Pastor Shirley, we were up in the north, uh, not, not that north, up in the mountains, Japan, and uh, we were caught in uh, minus seven degrees. Not that bad. It was a bit of snow, but it was more the strong winds in the mountains that really got us. We, we were not quite that well prepared. So we are years that got frozen up in the... You've seen some of the pictures, my face was like, no, that was not me, it was the wind that was blowing so strongly. <laughs> but praise God, we enjoyed it and it was a good time. And more, we're glad to be back to see the warmth of the people here. Amen. But praise God. You know, we're in a time right now where we're celebrating what we call the Chinese Lunar New Year. And the word Chinese is very important, isn't it? How many know that you were remembered in the Bible if you're a Chinese? Yeah, the book of Isaiah talks about it, that salvation shall come to even all the people of Sinim. And actually, if you study the concordance, the word Sinim actually refers to China. Wow. So God does talk about a time when the gospel, the good news, will come to all of China. And we must remember that the Chinese people, and I'm proud of that to say, that the Chinese people, we are not the oldest civilization. But we are the longest continuing civilization that continues to exist even today. Some 5,000 over years of history, and the Chinese as a civilization, as a people, continue to exist. Now, interesting. However, you must understand that <clears throat> with the length of civilization comes many things that are beliefs. Much belief system get worked in over the years. There become many traditions. There are many, many what we call cultural uh, norms and practices. And a lot of these are based on stories, myths, traditions, which are like legends. But, you know, one thing to remember as we look at this civilization, always remember that we as a people, not only Chinese, but as humanity, we are all made in God's image and after His likeness. And because of this, you'll find that there is imbued in each and every one. Look at somebody now. I see God in you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We are each imbued with God's beauty, God's creativity, God's goodness even. Because we are made in the very Word of God reminds us, Genesis 1.26, in his very image and after his likeness. But we must also remember that there was a time when man fell away. When there was a time in the garden where the first man sinned against God and so was separated from God. And the Bible says when this, this separation happened, death reigns. And this death was not only physical death, but it's also death that we saw in the spirit. But it's also death because of the fall that many of our belief system, many of our traditions, many of our cultural practices are imbued with and tainted with sin. And that's the reality. That's because of fallen nature that many of the things that we believe in and practice is tainted with sin. And I want to add this, and some of it are demonic. Now, as people will practice Chinese New Year. And Chinese New Year is one of the longest traditional festivals that have been practiced for thousands of years. What do we practice and what can we embrace? I've thought about this, so I'm not going to teach all over again about Chinese New Year and all the beliefs. But enough to understand that most Chinese beliefs are what we call synchristic. Synchristic is that it's a fusion of different systems, 
fusion also of different philosophies. And, you know, if you look at Chinese tradition cultures, you see that we get clouded with a lot of religious things. We have things like Confucianism. Right? And Confucians. Confucius was not a god, but he was a philosopher, a sage. Very lot of good sayings that had become entwined with culture and tradition. A lot of it is good, don't get me wrong. Things like teaching on filial piety and all those, all these are good. But you see, if you're not careful, they become so synchristic that they get mixed with what? Ancestral worship, for example. And this is where it becomes, and we must be careful, it becomes almost not only sinful, but demonic. Wherever it involves worship, there's not worship but the one true God. God reminds us in own word that He's a jealous God. Not because He is afraid that He loses our worship, but He's a jealous God for us. Because He knows that when we go and worship all the wrong things, we will open spiritual doorways for ourselves too. Because the Bible still warns us there's a thief that wants to kill, to steal and destroy Remember, if we are in God's image and likeness and if we are in that close relationship with God, Deuteronomy chapter 28 tells us something. Verse 4, 12, uh, 12 to 14 says, We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. And we are cautioned not to turn away from this God to worship all the other gods. But yet, understand that over the years, Syncretism in China has brought in not only philosophies like Confucianist philosophies, it's brought in belief of Taoism. How many know what Taoism is about? Taoism translated means the way of nature. And you know, I just came out of Japan, and in Japan, you'll find that only about 2% of the population there know about Christianity. 98% of Nearly 130 million old people in Japan either practice Shintoism, which is similar to Taoism. It's a worship of everything as nature and everything else too. And, of course, Buddhism that went to Japan. So there is also a very synchristic thing there, and there was a fusion. You know, one thing as I was there, chance to walk the streets, I was just praying, and I was praying for that nation. I said, God, here you have... I'm not talking about China, but here, China is revival and things happening, but here in Japan is dead. And I said, God, I wish I could meet some Christians here besides the one I already know. And you know, we were walking around the streets, my wife, myself, and all of a sudden, I saw this sign next to a lady. And here, there was right in winter cold, and she had this big sign next to her, no biblical truth. Oh, I was so happy. And she was handing out tracts to people who wanted to take it. Then I looked down below, Jehovah Witness. <laughs> now, I tell you this, I still regard them as Christian, although they may have certain beliefs that are a bit off. But you know, one thing I ask myself, what happened to the rest of the 2%? It seems that only those people like Jehovah Witnesses are so zealous for God. And this is one thing that hit me. Have we lost our zealousness of God. And the Lord reminded me of this verse from Isaiah about salvation coming even to Sinim. And then he put my heart. You know, Japan and China are very much related. Amen? And the word he put is, if but one man will make up the hedge and stand the gap. and just pray for the nation. And I said to God one thing. God, I'll start praying for that nation. Amen. And you know, our church believes in going out to missions. And we're not looked at places like Japan and things like that because it's like so far away. And too often we look only at the nearer third world countries. But I was so overwhelmed by the fact that here you have a nation that seems to be so caught up with themselves, their tradition and cultures, and yet so many of them yet do not know God. Not only because they don't know God, 
But if you understand what the Bible teaches us, they are heading on a road to hell. And as there's eternity for us who believe, there's also hell damnation for those who don't. And we had better not wonder too much from that. But that, that was the burden that came upon me even as I was walking there. And as I was just thinking about China itself, you know, in this last trip, we saw many, many people in China. Ah, first time I realised, I mean, I've been to China and all those, but I've never seen young people, very tall, six-footers and all, husbands and wives and all, all young people, and obviously they were loaded because we were travelling, doing things in the economy, they were going first class. You look at the dresses, everything, they were really, they had a lot of money. And it hit me too. You see, money alone doesn't ensure us or guarantee us a hope and a future. And, and this is a burden I hope that our church will continue to catch, a burden for those who have yet to come to hear the gospel. Okay, coming back to Lunar Chinese New Year. As I'll say, it's the oldest, most important to the Chinese people and the most consecutively uh, recorded festival that's being celebrated. And it's based on a lunar calendar. How many know the difference between lunar calendar and our Gregorian calendar that the Western world brought for us? In a lunar calendar, it was in something like the 14th century when this emperor called Huang Ti. And in a 2037 BC, it is by tradition that based on the exact astronomical observations of the longitude of the sun as well as the different phases of the moon, they came up with what is known as a lunar calendar. And apparently that calendar is more accurate. And that same lunar calendar is used in the Middle East. How do you know that? Actually, the Jewish calendar is actually based on that too. Uh, Gregorian calendar is not accurate. That's why you have a leap year in between just to make up for the lost. But this lunar calendar, because it follows the moon and everything else, and so you'll find that our Chinese New Year does not fall on a given date. It shifts and it moves, right? But we know about the time it is going to happen. And this is interesting. Because as I was looking at this, and trying to understand where did Chinese New Year come in? How many know that Chinese New Year is tied up with a special time of, of festivity for the Chinese people? How many know that? What's that? It's not just the beginning of New Year. I don't know what it is really. It's a celebration actually. In China, they used to call it the Spring Festival. It was not a New Year. It was time of celebrating the beginning the coming of springtime. And springtime means what? They will start to work again. You see, in China, in the old days, they were more agrarian community, I mean agricultural based. And agricultural based people work, they work to live, actually. Or do they live to work? It's a combination of both. Most of the time, they actually live because they have to work. You know, working in a, a, a farming context, Oh, I must tell you, my younger days, I had dreams of like retiring, be a country gentleman, farmer. Yeah, I'm serious. I actually went out to Australia to look at some farms. Then I realised farming is no country gentleman style. There's a lot of work to be done. I said, what? People got to wake up early in the morning, you know, work until late. I said, oh, that was not retirement life. But it's true, in a farmer, the life was very tough, very hard. They had to wake up early in the morning, and guess what? It's seven days a week. You know that dairy cows, for example, when they have to be milked, they have to be milked every day. You can't say, okay, I'm going to take two days off and come back milk. That poor cow will suffer, apparently. You know, if they don't get milk, they get bloated up with milk and things like that. And you can't tell your chicken, I'm not going to feed you. You're going to live for a while for a few days. It was every day the farmer had to really work. And do you know, this festival was actually a time when it was a time of new renewal. And I was trying to study the word nian, and I realized that 
the word mian was actually tied up with demonic beliefs. Do you know that? The root word of the word actually comes from a name that was given to a fiery dragon. A dragon that they believe would come out, you know, about the time after winter, have hibernation, will come out as a fearful, awesome dragon. And you've got to be careful because this dragon, after winter, is all hungry and all, and out on the prowl. And that's how this got tied up. It was more a spring festival, and it became like, we use that word, like a Chinese New Year. Actually, in, in the ancient Chinese, they think, didn't think of it as a year. They think of a festival. And it's very peculiar because they believe that whatever happens in this festival will guarantee either you got good luck for the rest of the year or bad luck in the rest of the year. How many of you still believe in luck? I'm glad you all didn't raise your hand. <laughs> you know, we say we don't believe it, but sometimes our practices we do. Touch wood <laughs> and all these things. But actually, luck is not something... Because luck is about chance. Amen? How many of you know this? If we believe in God, there's no more really a chance. God says there is a certainty. Amen? Jeremiah 29, 11, it comes and the certainty, God says, I know the plans I have for you. And they're plans of good and not of evil, plans to give you hope and a future. A lot of times we don't find certainty nor hope in the future because we are very far away from God. And we end up with life working and with different and wrong goals at that. You know, I just use the word, do we live to eat or do we eat? Either do we live to work or do we work to live? Very important question to ask ourselves. Because sometimes we can work and work and work and work and in the end, we never, never really enjoy the fruit of our labor. <clears throat> there was a farmer, Jesus said, a man who owns fields, and he was so confident. He said, when, when I gathered in the harvest, I'm going to build new barns. I'm going to have so much that what happens? I can then retire. I can lay down everything. But Jesus said, you're a fool. <laughs> because tonight you're going to die. And you know how many know that you can't take whatever we've accumulated into eternity? But we need to understand this very important thing, that God wants us to understand that He has a plan. Not just our own chances and good luck or bad luck. So anyway, but the Chinese believe this is important. This year, whatever happens in that time, it will determine the rest of the year. Wow. They don't want to test your luck, they gamble. I don't know how, I know Chinese gamble all the year round. But I was told in the old days, especially in the Chinese New Year, this, those period, people gamble like crazy. They bet everything. Uh, somebody even told me in the old days that the wife was the last bet. Uh, when you, you lose everything, then you bet your wife. Well, I, I, know, I know some people put the wife as the first bet, but <laughs> praise God, <laughs> they're not here in this church, amen. <laughs> but the key was this, it was a good start. So actually, the preparation started even before the actual date of the new year itself. There was, how many have you been doing it? House cleansing. Is that a good practice? Well, we can do either facial house cleansing or it's time to declutter. You know, some people never declutter at all. And you find things get accumulated, accumulated. That's why there are a lot of store hubs around now. So that you've got no place in the house, you can put it in a store hub, rent a little place and, and put your things there. But this is one of the things I've learned. We tend to clutter our lives with a lot of rubbish. Yeah, every time I walk to my room, I see all the books I've accumulated over the last 20 years, so 24 years when, since I became a Christian. Christian books! I keep telling myself I got declutter. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? I accumulate so much, but I never go back and read some of them. But anyway, it's a time of house cleansing. It's a time also in traditional, they always believe, you see, a lot of practice, I said, has certain imbued with God's goodness and perhaps a teaching. You know, they have couplets. Have you ever seen couplets in Chinese houses? Little red things on both sides. 
You know, one day I was looking at it and it hit me all of a sudden. What the Bible says, the blood of the lamb was struck upon the lintels and the doorposts. You know, and, and you read those couplets, they are red things they put on, and actually words of blessing. And every year, when it comes to Chinese New Year, before that, when they clean up the house, they will also change those couplets in order to be able to get fresh blessings for the year. Amen. How many know that in Christianity, we don't need to seek that sort of fiscal act for the blessing. But anyway, it was also a time that we would begin to fill up a lot of things. I still remember my parents and my grandmother, especially very, very pantang about this. Must make sure the, the rice container must be full. There must oil, there must everything because she says, that's very important. If you don't have that, the rest of the year would not be good. It means it would not be filled up. So make sure you fill it all up. And, and this was always part of practice. Of course, New clothes are very important. New clothes, new shoes. Uh, I didn't go have any new clothes, but I made sure I had a new shoe. Amen. <laughs> no, no, I got this at the offer, that's why. <laughs> but <clears throat> this is part of the whole tradition. Everything must be renewed. So you start with everything new. Now, <clears throat> but the real preparation, after all the preparation... So, what's the first thing that starts the Chinese New Year? Actually, it's the Eve. Eve itself. <clears throat> and the tradition was for a family reunion dinner. It's very important because in China, people get spread out, they go and different things. And it's coming together where they can begin to have a time where the family sits together to eat. Chinese eating is very important. That's our first greeting, right? It's a part of greeting, right? Because food is very important. So, the reunion dinner, although I can't understand today, people are starting reunion dinner so early for convenience. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked uh, to find that some people even one week before book for reunion dinner already. I, I think it loses part of the, the whole meaning for family to get together. It's you can do a dinner for family anytime. Because I was brought up in, my, my grandparents were from China, and also so that reunion dinner became a very, very important part of the beginning of the festivity. It was about a family coming together to eat together and to begin to yeah, talk together. So reunion dinner was really the start. And of course, those days, they didn't have low hair. Lohei was started as a practice much more, well, recent. I don't know where it started. Some people say it started in Hong Kong. Some people say, no, it started out here. And the idea of Lohei goes with the idea of luck again. Uh, of fish. Uh, last, night, last night, my family, we had Lohei together, but no fish, but we got bakwa in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we just did that for a change, but... You know, it's very important. Why? It's all part of the symbolism. Yeah? Nian nian yu yi. It's all good fortune for every year. So everything, what you eat, and of course, tossing. You know, when you start toss, everything the higher the better. It's like tossing salad, but toss high. And then you've got half of it outside on the table instead. <laughs> and, and I tell you, it's funny. Uh, this was like three years ago, we were at a restaurant, and... and the waitress actually came with a whistle. When you say toss, she's blow pee, 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 with a whistle. I mean, people are always trying to add, add new things to add to the festivity and everything. Yeah, I, I mean, my brother in law caught on and started blowing whistle also when they do low. But this is how we kind of catch on to, and it becomes part of tradition. So we got old tradition not so old tradition, some very new added on tradition. And of course, the first day was a very important day. Uh, and that's when you, this part of the filial piety ancestral teaching, which I think is good, okay? There's nothing wrong with filial piety if we don't bring it to a level of ancestral worship. I think that's where a line must be drawn. Fine line do be when you respect your parents, you respect what they tell you, or do you obey blindly everything you're told to do, even though it may be demonic? 
I know people struggle because in the family where there's non-believers, you go home and they say you've got also to offer something to the ancestral table. That's why I say to many Christians, it's good to let people know early that you already become a Christian. Rather than last minute when they find out because you're asked to do things that you refuse to do, then they say you're unfilial, you're this and that. You see, I, I, I've learned something. All this has got spiritual dimension. So if you tell them I'm already a Christian and I can't do this because yeah, I do it chiong. That's a very good word. You know what? Chiong. You know chiong? Things clash. Conflict. Very good word. They'll tell, okay, 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 because... Yeah, Chinese New Year, beginning good year, how can you have conflict starting? So you tell them, now I become a Christian, you know, I can't go and worship all the other gods, cause conflicts. Hey, they understand that. I've, I've even advised people, even in funeral things, to let people know first early, otherwise they want you to walk around and carry joysticks and things like that. And, and those are the times not to start talking about the thing because there is a bit of a sensitivity. So I always tell people, Tell people that you are already a Christian before the actual Chinese New Year itself. So that when you go and visit, you won't get caught in having to, you see, nothing wrong with participating in tradition, culture, if it does not include things that are demonic. Worship, for example, is demonic. Okay, so that's where we got to be very careful how to draw a line. Now, this goes on, visitation to parents. I think it's a good thing. Visitation to older people to do it on the, as a mark of respect too. And of course, this visitation continues throughout the 15 days. Now, people ask me, what about bring an orange? You all got an orange when you walk in, right? <laughs> uh, we all got this struggle because is that something which is demonic? I said, no, it's part of tradition and culture because it's only like wishing you blessing. I know, I know, there, there's symbolism in that, in that orange is supposed to be fertility. Do you, do you all know that? Bringing abundance, like fortune, good fortune offering. You, do you know that? Even for uh, ladies who are not married, I can't remember what night I did a study in it. In the old days, they'll go to a bridge by river, throw orange down into the water <laughs> so that you get a, a husband by next year. <laughs> you all didn't know those old today. I did a study of that, very interesting. There are a lot of practices that have been brought in, even with oranges. And I believe if you just don't believe in the, the, the other things, yeah, we just bring it as a blessing. And why? Because we also don't want to be a stumbling block, especially to people who are not believers. Because they say, wow, now you become a Christian, you don't show respect anymore. Because if they're giving oranges, it's just like respect to them, you see. And if there's nothing involved with demonic things and worship, I've got no problems with it. Amen. I love eating the Mandarin orange, especially the one from Swatow type. Easy to peel off skin. Maybe the laziness, but... Have you wondered, is it okay to eat it with those roots in it or it must peel off? My grandmother used to tell me, you know, you must peel those things off, otherwise, Joachia. I don't know if it's true or not, but up to now, it's, uh, from what she said, uh, habit, I always pull off the string. You know, when you take the or mandarin orange, there's like all those little roots sting on it. Anyway, uh, my wife would say, no, 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 keep it on. <laughs> okay, different people got different beliefs. But again, with such beliefs, I find no problem with it because... It's nothing that's going to do with worship or demonic things. Now, what are the practices? When I was young, I loved to receive red packets. Then I get older, not so good because I got to give red packets. <laughs> it, I, I love the recent joke somebody used to send me. Ama, Akong, ah, digital orange. <laughs> you, you saw that? It's quite good, digital orange. And then, okay, okay, I'm getting ang pao. Digital ang pao. <laughs> I thought that was good, amen. <laughs> but there's some tradition and culture. I got nothing wrong with giving of red packets. You see, the belief about that this red was about this dragon that come out. And, and they believe that what chases dragon away is wearing red. Firecrackers, the noise. But more important, 
I mean, my father was a Christian. Come, his, his father was a pastor. But he was a businessman and believed all this superstition too. Oh, I still remember our house. You buy the crackers, firecrackers all around. So that by the time you finish, the driveway, the garden side, all full of rain. All for luck. But actually, the belief was that they believed this red would keep the dragon away. Wow. It, it reminds me of Revelation. How many remember the verse in Revelation? Yeah, that actually the dragon was cast down. Yeah, and we overcome him by the blood of the lamb. And the red is so symbolic of the blood of the lamb. It's just like they put those couplets, I believe, like the blood that struck on the lintels and doorposts. You see, you must understand a lot of the tradition is part and parcel of the root. I believe China, the Chinese people were the people that were sent east. Yeah, they read the Bible, very interesting. Okay, and sent east. And we are part of the people that actually came from the part of the old uh, beliefs in the Middle East. Anyway, so they believe that you, whatever you do in the Chinese New Year sets the tone for the whole year. And there's a lot of superstition. Now, in fact, I wrote down so many things, but I was very interested in, actually, I'm not going to do a whole teaching on it. I did that before. We went through all the different customs. So, for me, giving oranges, no problem. Giving ang pao, welcome. <laughs> no problem with that. And only thing I want to say this, because tonight, today I don't speak too much, but do you know that China, being the oldest civilization, was blessed with a lot of knowledge? Yes. If you study it, China was, had a compass. Yeah. Do you know the compass was what enabled China, the Chinese sailors to be able to sail out? Do you know there was a very famous Chinese admiral? How many know his name? Cheng Ho. Now, in fact, I was reading a, a documentary that said it was accredited that he was the one who brought Islam to this part of the world, you know. Surprisingly. Um, because he was Muslim. Do you know that the biggest Muslim community is outside the Middle East, it's in China? Because the Silk Road, the trading, a uh, lot of the, the uh, Chinese with surnames like Ma actually are Muslims. Uh, and also, so he was actually a Muslim, and, and actually how did he come down? You know story here, the story of how Singapore was founded. Do you know how Singapore was founded? I should hope so. Do you remember a name called Paramaiswara? Uh, Paramaiswara was actually a Hindu prince. Uh, he was from the two empires that was in Indonesia. There were Hindu empires there. That's why Bali and all those, Borobodo and all those are all part of the Hindu beliefs. Okay, so there were two big Hindu empires and he was on a prince that lost out and he fled with his men and he came to Singapore. He saw a lion. And eventually, he ended up in Malacca, and he started to build a little kingdom there. And at the time, the strongest uh, political inf or military power around this area were the Siamese. And the Siamese was causing him a lot of problems. And this guy decided to counter this by becoming a uh, sending tribute to China. And the Chinese emperor actually sent Emperor Cheng Ho to come down. Uh, to show the force and apparently he came down with, I can't remember, do you, do you see the documentary? He had a few hundred ships in his, in his uh, fleet that came with him. And because of the compass, they were able to sail all the way up to the Middle East. Yeah, that was in the time of Cheng Ho. The, the Chinese uh, fleet actually went all the way to Africa and all those things. And the fleet was so extensive that they had boats that were farms too. Yeah, they, their farming was carried on on the boats to sustain the fleet as you travel. So interesting. Now, China was given a lot of scientific knowledge. And for example, do you know gunpowder? It was invented in China. Take, for example, the printing press. Do you know the printing press was not started by William, William Caxton in England? It was actually in China. They started printing already. 
But you see, the problem of the beliefs, which is very synchristic, and one thing the Chinese believe is that you don't try to change things. You try to keep things in harmony. You balance the negative and the positive. So everything must be kept in balance. So if you have scientific knowledge, you don't try to innovate, improve anything. You just live with what you have. And, and this is interesting itself. Uh, for those who are really interested in studying more, unfortunately, I was looking through, I'm sad to say that a lot of the study on China was actually done by Caucasians. Yeah, and, and one of them was a guy called Joseph Needham. He lived from 1900 to 1985. And, and he was quite a bit, not only a biochemist, he was a trained scientist. Uh, and he was a historian. He was very interested in history. And he was also called a sinologist. That's the first time I heard the word, sinologist. means he was recognized as a specialist on the study of... Sino is another word for China. You all didn't know that. Amen. Okay, so here he actually compiled a book that's called Science and Civilization in China. And this was seven volumes that made up 27 books. <clears throat> and this was a project he started in 1954. He compiled it with collaboration with different people like, you know, who were very interested in the study of China. And, and <clears throat> a volume one in that one uh, was actually compiled with uh, this guy called Robert Temple. And is still recognized in the world today as one of the best history books on China. But anyway, in, in this thing, you're talking about how science and civilization, and China has so much things that the West did not even know about at that time. And that was part of the civilization of China. But because of the mindset of how they were brought up, uh, what happened? They only just don't know how to use it. Gunpowder until the West came to teach them, they were using like firecrackers to scale, things like that. Um, especially during the eclipse of the moon. They believe that's a dragon swallowing the moon, so fire, a lot of fireworks up there to scare it away. But interesting. So for those who are interested, go and read it. It makes very interesting reading. Okay, 27, uh, there are seven volumes in some 27 books of it. It's still available, I think, on Amazon.com. If you, you don't mind a whole set of books, uh, know something about your tradition, culture, and everything else. But as I read this, I'll read Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The Bible reminds us, for the invisible of things of Him. God may not be visible to us, but we can see God, what He says, from the creation of the world. And they are not, how many know creation is not visible? Creation was physical, where we can see. And you can clearly see, and understood by the things that are made, that even His eternal power in Godhead, so man really is without excuse. You can't say there's no such thing as God. If you don't believe that there is no God, then what? Why worry about where you're going? Why worry about eternity? This life you must enjoy yourself because when you die, there's nothing anymore. Right? But if there is, then there's accountability. And here, verse 21 of Romans chapter 1 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him, not as God, Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, your thoughts and things like that. And their foolish heart became darkened. Verse 22 especially, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And as I read Chinese history, that was when at one point in time, when the emperors wanted to declare themselves as God, that was when actually started a lot of things. The burning of the books and everything else. Trying to destroy knowledge, trying to everything else. 
and verse 23 says, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know, as I thought about this, I was just reminded that lunar calendar is actually made up of, how many know, it's five cycles, each five cycles of 12 years. That makes us, every cycle of the moon itself is supposed to be 60 years. In this 12 years, because it's so synchristic, they begin to name it different animals. Okay. How many believe in all these animal things? Yeah, they, they name it, actually, there's a legend behind all this. And they call the years of the cycle itself, one year called the rat, the ox, the tiger, the rabbit, the dragon, the snake, the horse, the sheep, monkey, rooster, dog. How do you know they say this is a dog year? Mm, so I made sure when I came back to bring something for my little doggies. <laughs> Not because I was shipping them. And the pig, you know. So they believe that actually this thing determines your character and everything else. So when people still come to me and ask me, see or see me, you know what that means, right? They ask you really what year you're born in. I said, I'm born in the year of a man. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, it's true, we are made in God's. Ah, amen. Not in the likeness. And the Bible talks about this. Even before these practices start, the Bible has, Paul has said about all things that we don't acknowledge God. Therefore, we turn the uncorrupt, incorruptible God to become into human image, animals and things like that. And, and there's consequence resulting there. So if we understand this, it is something good for us to realise I don't believe there's anything wrong with tradition, culture, beliefs, systems, and everything else. But always be careful. Test it against the Word of God. Only the Word of God can show us what is, I mean, all of it is tainted with sin. What are things that we should not embrace and should not practice because they are demonic, demonic, uh, demonic, and open the door to spiritual dimensions that we should not be going into. Now, there's a very good pastor. I read some of his teachings. Dr. R. A. Hymas. Have you heard of him? Dr. R. J. Uh, R. L. Hymas Jr. Uh, he is a Baptist pastor that's now pastoring a church in Los Angeles. And he spent some years as a missionary in China. So very interesting if you read some of his sermons or you hear his sermons or you think he talks a lot about this thing, about science, about actual thing. And especially with China, he analysed the country of China in four stages. He said China started as a land of God, Shenzhou. How many of you at the movie that we showed here called Shenzhou? Okay, if those are interested we we'll screen that movie again. And it's so interesting. The movie is about how originally, when China in the early days, the name of China was called Shenzhou, Land of God. And they actually believe in a one true God. And there was a worship of that heavenly king. What's the heavenly king? Sun, sun, uh, Shanti. Shanti, which is the heavenly king. You know, and there was no other religions. In fact, there was this worship and the emperors those days, they had a lot of practices they could not understand. They even built a temple in the Forbidden City. This temple was called Tian Tang. How many went there? Actually, I, I was there and you'd be surprised to see there is no idols. There's nothing, not even a picture. <clears throat> and part of tradition in the old days was the emperor was to bring the first fruit and make a sacrifice at the beginning of this Chinese New Year at that very place itself. Very interesting. There were a lot of Chinese traditional beliefs. One of the things that China, the Chinese emperor do was to actually make a sacrifice. Uh, he was to take the animal outside of the gates to kill the animal there to make a sacrifice. Before he do that, he lay hands on him to transfer all the bad luck and everything of the year onto the animal, then kill the animal so that you stay outside the city. Now, isn't that so symbolic of our Lord who had to be taken outside the city and who was crucified for our sins? Uh, there was many of these practices that 
even Confucius say he doesn't understand why these practices were given. Now, did you know that a lot of Chinese characters actually has roots in the Bible? You know, I've been told you write the word righteousness. The two words on top is about two trees there. If you study the word chuan, you know it's a chuan, right? It's a boat. Very peculiarly, the characters made up is eight mouth and a horn. You know, eight mouth. Noah, his wife, three sons, and three daughter in laws. They made eight people that was in a boat. And you can see even the word blessing or luck, we call it. Fu, fu, fu. Uh, fu. If you look at the word, you know, on this side is actually the word shen zi pang. And then the word yi kou tian. And that makes a luck. So what it really means is there's God. The yi kou tian is one small petty field, becomes luck. If you take away the, the God side of it, life is nothing but one small petty few. Ah, suffering. And you know, unfortunately, because people don't understand, they will take the word and they, you know, they put it upside down. Because put it upside down, how soon luck arrived. Wow, if it's so easy, I better stick it all over here. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. And this gives you a hint that China actually used to be from people from that part and they worship the one true God. And then he wrote about this, uh, Dr. Hyman said to say, that the land of God became a land of many gods at one time when all the other religions and all came in. Buddhism and then Taoism evolved and all those superstitious things, the book of I Ching and all those became part of Chinese traditional belief, very synchristic, everything was like merged together. And so it became a land of many, many gods. And then he talks about how with the communism, when it came in, it started before communism, when the emperor wanted to be worshipped like God. And that was when uh, emperor, the emperor would call himself as God, and he changed the name of Sun, uh, uh, the land of God, Sun Zhou, to become Zhongguo, with a center kingdom. And he's the center of everything. So it became a land of no God. And the communists perpetuated that. You know, communism doesn't believe in God. Yeah. Uh, I've been to China. And when I was, uh, you know, you didn't get a choice. Do you work with the underground church or you work with the three self church? And even when I went there to work with the three self church, we were not allowed to preach to the local population. We could only preach to the expat community, expat services. Expat services, you don't get a local Chinese going there. You only get those who are married to expats allowed to go in. And even then, we are given certain limitations. I cannot preach on end times. That's one of the main conditions. You know why? They believe the Communist Party is going from eternity to eternity. There's no end times. <laughs> yeah, there's no God. It is the party. So you can't go there and preach about end times. But this is part of the belief. So it became a land of no God. But today, history is showing something. That China is returning to be a land of a one true God. Okay, if you read about what's happening in China, at one time, there was so much revival. Uh, people getting saved, people again. And I, I saw this in action. I was actually in China, and I was talking to somebody, and this person was talking about being saved as a Christian when he found out as a pastor, and so excited. So I said, uh, asked this stupid question. I said, I forgot. I said, which church do you go to? And then she looks at me and she said, no, I don't go to church. So I started, you know, my tirade in my limited Chinese saying that we Christians, Hebrews 10, please do not forsake the assembling together. You know, like that. and then she looked at me all shocked. Then something hit me. So I asked her, how did you get saved? And she started telling me a story how she had a growth in her arm and started growing. And she was afraid it was cancer. And she did not go and see a doctor. But it got, started to grow and everything. And she was telling a neighbor. So the neighbor said, can we pray for you? So she thought, what can you lose? Okay, pray for me. Now. And guess what? The neighbor brought her house, brought her whole friends over, and they laid hands and prayed to her. And guess what? She got healed. 
And because that she believed. Because her husband believed. And where is she worshipping? With a group. That's house church. And I tell you, this is interesting because in China, this is happening. Many, many people are getting saved. There was a friend of mine who went to China many years ago and he went to the underground church to preach. And they gathered a whole group of pastors. I can't remember, like 30, 40 pastors were there and gathered. And he decided to preach on end times, about persecution, about everything. He said, wow, he taught in a seminar about persecution, everything. And during the break, when they were having all this fellowship time, he was talking to different pastors. So different pastor introduced. One pastor said, oh, I'm a pastor of a small church. I only have 200,000 members. He was like, huh? Oh. <laughs> and I've been in prison for the last 15 years. <laughs> and he's talking about persecution. <laughs> I want to tell you something. History has recorded it's in persecution that church growth grew. You heard me talk about persecution that's coming. I wouldn't go into that now. But you'll be surprised. I'm praying God if that's the only way, let it happen. <coughs> Amen. God would rather us be persecuted on this side of eternity than end up on the wrong side of eternity. And this is something good to remember. So, I believe this. China will one day be a country that worships the one true God. Can you imagine? They said there's something like already 20 over 30% of Chinese, and that's a very conservative estimate of converts today of the whole of China. And I get excited because there's over a billion people now. 20% of billion people is a lot of people. Two out of one million people. If they all come to Singapore, we will swamp. <laughs> and, and I believe this, time is running short. Even as we celebrate Chinese New Year, as we celebrate what God has blessed us with in this country, remember, the call for us as a church in Singapore is a call to be the Antioch of the East. The Antioch of the East was a place of sending out, a place where Christians were not just satisfied with sitting in church and playing church. And this is something I believe, I want to just say this as a challenge to each and every one of you. Ask God, God, how can I be part of the destiny that you have for me? How can I be in a place of significance? How can I be that person of influence for you? I know some of you might say, yeah, but I, I don't go overseas. I don't. Do you know, in Singapore, we've got less, about, they say about 20%. Are Christians here too? You know, you've got a big mission field down here. Some 80 over percent of Singaporeans have yet to know Jesus. And this is not counting also the expat community that comes in here. Migrant workers, they're working here. Yeah. Think of it. And all it takes is somebody just to ask a question. Do you know Jesus? Amen. You can be that somebody you can be the one that conveys the gospel. I tell you, when you live your life and you live it right in a certain way, people will come and ask you the question. Before I started pastoring, I had many of my friends come up and ask me, what made you stop smoking? What made you stop gambling? What made you stop drinking? Yeah, I used to be a horrible guy. That's my testimony. I was a man of bad reputation. God told me and made me a man of no reputation. Amen. Now we've got nothing to lose. How many got things to lose? Amen. We've got nothing to lose. That's the important thing. You can be a donkey for Jesus. Amen. So this is my challenge for you as a Chinese New Year reflection. Think of it. Think of the number of people out there who have never yet even known Jesus. Not without stepping into a church. What can you do to be part of that conduit? Amen. I don't want to preach on too long today. Third day, still, you still want to go visitations and have makans and dinners to go, lunch to go to. So let's close this time with a word of prayer. 
And Father, we look to you right now. We well, I thank you that we can sit in comfort like this, in a hall that's so furnished with all the modern equipment and everything, in air condition. And we think of so many and so many neighbouring countries they've yet to know you. We're going to especially pray, not just for our neighbours in Malaysia, in Indonesia, especially in Brunei, or even in Thailand, just around further a bit, in Myanmar, or even in the whole Indochina region, as you remember, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Lord. I always look at China and the huge country that's there, or even Japan, a country that less than 2%, they say, know you. Father, I pray right now, you raise us a church in this end times. I pray for each and every member here, Father, of our church, that we be not be caught up so much with the blessings and distractions of life, that we can not see and miss the fact there are so many of people around us who are going on to the wrong side of eternity. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our hearts, Lord. I hear your word. It only takes one to pray. It only takes one man to make up the hedge to stand in the gap. One man. I know Lord Jesus has already come. But he's looking for today men and women that will say, Here, my Lord, will you send me? Father, I thank you for all the creature comforts you've given to us in Singapore. We thank you for all the blessings they've given to us in Singapore. We thank you for all the jobs you've given to us in Singapore. We thank you for the finances. We thank you for all they've given to us. But God, help us look beyond all these things. Open our eyes so we can see beyond these things around us, around our own church. Help us, God. Won't you help us bring the light to the nations? Bring the light even as we celebrate Chinese New Year, even to the loved ones that we will visit over this next rest of these 15 days, Lord. That we can begin to stand up and be counted to our relatives and friends and loved ones who have not yet come to know Jesus. I pray, Lord, let our lives be counted. Let our lives make a difference. Do you know you can make a difference? If you just say, Hear my Lord, use me. So, Father, as I commit this time, I commit this Chinese New Year to you. I thank you. You said 2018 is going to be a year that's important, a year that's going to be a catalyst where there's going to be increased acceleration, increased momentum of what you're doing in this season. Help us be mindful of this and not be caught and found wanting in this time. Stir our hearts, Lord. Stir our hearts, Lord. And give us a sense of the urgency of the times. Give us a sense of the urgency, Lord, to rise up. And I give you glory, I give you thanks, I give you praise. I see men and women that have been called to be salt of the earth. Then you're called to be light of the world. So bless them to, to be able to go out, to be that salt, to be that light, Lord. And I give you thanks, I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.